you're on here, amen, amen, amen. Let's open up to Revelation chapter 13. That's where we're going to be at today, Revelation chapter 13. And we need a little bit of encouragement, don't we? After what we saw last night, we need a little bit of encouragement. Let's see what it has to say to us. Uh, Monday, we talked about the woman and the dragon and my belief of who the woman and the dragon are. I'm going to share a little bit about my belief about the beast today in Revelation chapter 13. Because the truth of the matter is, we can debate all day long about who the beast is, but if you take, and I'm going to try to convince you of my interpretation, if you take my interpretation on the book of Revelation, to me it fits not only for the people back then who John is trying to encourage, the persecuted church, the suffering church, but it also fits and applies to today. And... And I think that's who John was writing to. John was writing specifically to the persecuted church. Now, why would John write a message for thousands and thousands of years to them back then? It doesn't naturally apply. So if you think about that, there's so many books out there where it's saying, this is who the beast is. The beast is, is, is a president. They tried to say Ronald Reagan was a beast, you know? They tried to uh, say Hitler was the beast, you know? And yeah, they were, you know, Hitler was a beast in some sense, but we try to always label the beast and we'll try to write these books and people will be selling these books on the end times and on Revelation. And the truth of the matter is, if you just go back to the Old Testament, if people would just go back to the Old Testament. My son recently um, wrote a, a paper for college and he's a senior this year and he's writing college papers already and, and um, getting some college credits. And one of the things that he wrote this last week, and I was so impressed, he says, what's the importance of the Old Testament? That was the question. What was the importance of the Old Testament? And his thesis was the Old Testament is necessary to understand the New Testament. And it really is. If, if you understand the Old Testament, you'll start to understand the New Testament a little bit better. But the thing is, a lot of people don't take the time to study the Old Testament. So what we're going to see in Revelation chapter 13, what we see here, it says, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. And it says, And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads and the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshiped the dragon because he had been given the authority to the beast. And they also gave and worshiped the beast and asked who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? So they're asking this question. This, this beast is powerful. Who can ultimately make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them, and he was giving authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants on the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have been written in the book of life, belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is, it, is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls for patience, endurance, and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Now, ultimately, what this is saying is that there's a beast. There's a beast that rises up out of the abyss. And the dragon, who we talked about on Monday, who is Satan, dragon, gives authority over to the beast. Now, I say that you need to understand the Old Testament because if you understood the book of Daniel, this is the same description in the book of Daniel. If you go to Daniel chapter 7, what we see is that we see that there is a beast. There's actually four beasts that Daniel talks about. Daniel's dream of four beasts. And each of these beasts was a kingdom. He sees this dream about these beasts, about horns on their head, and it's the same description here. And then in verse 15, it says, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me I approached one of them standing there and asked him the meaning of this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of the thing. He said, the four great beasts 
are the four kings that will rise from the earth. But the holy people, the Most High, will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the meaning of the four beasts, which was different from all the others and most terrifying with its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured the victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell, the horn that looked most imposing than the others and had eyes and mouth that spoke boastfully. So again, this, this boastful beast. And what we're seeing here is that they were kingdoms. They were kingdoms that actually rose up. Here, the beast, in my opinion, is Rome. And the reason I believe it's Rome is because Rome is currently in power when John is receiving this book. And he's talking about the dragon giving power to the beast. And everybody needs to bow down. All right? I just preached about this this past week on Revelation chapter 17 is a description of this beast. If you fast forward, it talks about this beast who was on seven hills. And Imperial Rome was known to be the great city built on seven hills. And so I think John is specifically writing about this beast, which is Rome, built on seven hills. A lot of times um, the Caesars were referred to as kings, and it's talking about the city that's built on seven hills that had these kings who had these Caesars. And ultimately what's happening is the people who are being persecuted have to make the decision. They have to make the decision on whether they're going to worship Caesar or they're going to worship Jesus. You see, worship for them was so much more than just singing a few songs. Worship for them was every aspect of their life. And so if they admitted that Jesus was their Lord, ultimately what they're saying is that Caesar is not. And this is why the people are being led away in blasphemy. The beast was given a mouth, it says in verse 5, to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He's in charge and he's saying, you must worship Caesar. You have to worship Caesar. And because the Christians were refusing to worship Caesar, because the Christians were taking a stand and saying, Jesus is our Lord, they were being put to death. You see, it wasn't just because they were worshiping somebody. It wasn't just because they were singing songs. It's because worship affected every aspect of their life, the decisions that they made, and they refused to worship Caesar. If you remember, in the book of Daniel, we get three characters, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And Nebuchadnezzar says, you are to bow down and you are to worship me. And they refused to bow down and worship Nebuchadnezzar's statue and he ultimately gets upset and throws them into the fiery furnace. Jesus comes and protects them and that's exactly what we're seeing here. He says that this authority is coming and there he's reigned for a period of 42 months. 42 months is a symbolism of of a time period again. Three and a half years uh, ultimately is you know this time period that we see over and over again in the Bible where God is just talking about a time period. And he says, he opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. These are the saints who are being persecuted, they're being put to death. And it says, and he was given authority over every tribe, people, nation, uh, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have been not been written in the book of life. So. Ultimately, these are people who have not taken a stance to follow after Jesus. They've not taken a stance to follow. And so why is this important? Why is it important where they can't just say, you know what, I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to bow down to Caesar. I believed in Jesus, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do whatever Caesar, Caesar says. The reason this is so important is because the devil has given this beast power and Jesus knew whatever we worship we eventually become let me say that again whatever we worship we eventually become if you remember in Matthew chapter 12 Jesus was healing and he was healing people and they said it's because that he works for Satan 
that he's able to heal. It's because he works for Satan that he's ultimately able to drive out devils and demons. And it's because he's one of Satan's helper. And Jesus looks at them and says, can a kingdom that is divided amongst itself stand? He says, how can I possibly be on Satan's team? How could I possibly be working for the dragon? How could I possibly be working for the devil? And then Jesus goes on in Matthew 12, verse 30, and he says, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Now, that's always puzzled me. I'm like, you know, doesn't Jesus forgive all sins? Is, is he really talking about, like, if, if we sit there and say, you know, a cuss word around God, you know, is, is, what is he talking about when he talks about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? I've always kind of wondered that. And then it clicked. The, the Holy Spirit's job is to guide us toward Jesus. The Father is the creator, the Son is the redeemer, and the Holy Spirit is the guide. And he's always guiding us back to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the redeemer. And so if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, what it's saying is you don't believe in the Holy Spirit. If you blaspheme God, it's not really saying that it's a cuss word around God. It's saying that you've denied that God is your Lord. And if you do not accept that Jesus is your Lord, then the truth of the matter is you can't be saved because Jesus is the only way to salvation. Jesus came and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And so by blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you're denying Jesus Christ. By blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you're saying, I'm not going to give allegiance to Jesus. I am not going to worship Jesus. Instead, I am following the ways of the world. And so when Rome comes in, Caesar, who is king, or is seen as a king, is saying, you need to bow down and you need to accept my laws and my ways and my authority. You need to accept me as king. You need to accept me as being divine. And the Christians are saying, no, we cannot accept Caesar because we already have a king. We already worship him. And whatever you worship, you become. And so believers, when they worship Jesus, Jesus is their king, Jesus is their Lord, what do they do? They begin to show more mercy, more peace, more grace, more of the fruits of the Spirit, patience. Because we begin to follow Jesus, and Jesus is our example, he is our king, so we follow after him. We begin to become more like Jesus. We have the fruits of the Spirit show up in our life. But if you accept the world as your king, well, look at what it says in Romans 1. I mean, I flip over to Romans 1 and, and in the book of Romans, right after Acts, if you go there with me, it says that we start to become like everyone else. If we worship the ways of the world, we start to become more like the world. I mean, that was Paul's issue with Romans you know, in Romans 1 verse 18, it says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and the divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. He's saying, you can see through the clouds, you can see through creation that God exists. So men are without excuse. For all they, they knew God, they neither glorified him as God or gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and foolish hearts were darkened. So they began to worship creation instead. They knew creation, they knew God, but they neither worshiped him nor gave thanks to him, it says. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. And so they began to exchange the worship of the creator for the world wor worship of the creation. And when we worship the creation, we become like the creation. Notice what it says in verse 24. It says, therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual immorality, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. 
Amen. And so because of this, God gave them over to their shameful lusts. Even the woman exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones in the way that men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received themselves a due penalty for the rewards. And it continues on and it talks about how we're now slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful, and vain ways of doing dis-evil things. You know? And so whatever we worship, we become. And so here, in Revelation 13, there's a choice. Are you going to worship God as your king and as your Lord? Or are you going to blaspheme God and worship the beast? Are you going to worship the nation? Which goes into kind of um, relevancy today as we just saw this debate and people are putting their faith in two candidates. They're putting their faith in the next president. They're putting their faith in this nation and they're discouraged and they're disheartened. And ultimately what this is saying is, are you gonna worship God or are you gonna worship the nation? For them back then, were they gonna worship Jesus or are they gonna worship Caesar? Because if they worship Caesar, they're gonna be inflamed with those lusts, power, money, you know, influences. What the nation provides, that's what they're gonna become. They're gonna lust after those things, sexual impractices, power, money, nation, that's what they're ultimately, but if you've worshiped God, it's about grace, mercy, peace, it's about the gospel, it's about people finding Jesus, it's about salvation, it's totally different things that you're pursuing, it's the motives of your heart because of what you're becoming. So who are you putting your faith in? Well, there's a lot of people today who are putting their faith in still the Caesar, the king, the next president. They're putting their faith in one of our candidates. And yes, we should all vote. Yes, we should all have um, an opinion. Yes, we should all ultimately um, stand for what we believe in, who's going to guide us best. But if we put our hope in the next elected official, that he's our savior, that he's going to bring things peace. If we see him raised up, then we're putting our hope in a person. Our hope is always to be in Jesus. Because no matter who sits as the next president of the United States, Jesus is still on the throne. Jesus still reigns. Jesus is still in control. That's what the book of Revelation is telling us. Nero is killing Christians. They have a bad ruler in place, and he's reminding the Christians that you don't put your faith in Nero. You don't put your faith in a king. You don't put your faith in Caesar. You don't put your faith in the nation. You don't put your faith in an elected official. You put your faith in Jesus. And this is why he tells them at the very end, he said, all whose names have been written in the book of life, belonging to the Lamb of God. These are Christians. These are followers that have been slain from the creation of the world, people who have been martyred for this message, for the gospel. He who has an ear, let him hear. He says, if anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will go. This calls for patient endurance. We live in a time period of patient endurance where we're going to have elected officials, kings, Caesars, come and go. We're to be patient. And faithfulness on the part of us believers, we need to have faith as we put our eyes on Jesus. Our focus needs to be on Jesus. And it says that's our responsibility as saints, as followers of Jesus. We put our eyes on Jesus. Jesus is our king. Jesus is our Lord. He sits on the throne. We are to worship him. The way that people are going to change is by putting their eyes on Jesus. The way the nation is going to change, our cities are going to change, people are going to be different, is by putting our eyes on Jesus. We become more like Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit is relevant. Kindness. I don't know how much kindness is being shown today. Patience. I don't know how much patience is being shown today. Gentleness. Self-control. We are not a people of self-control. We need to put our eyes on Jesus. As Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate, and he's like, hey, aren't you a king? And Jesus says, yes, my kingdom's not of this world. He was patient. He was in control. Even in handcuffs, he was in control. Paul understood what it meant to be in handcuffs and still in self-control, believing that Jesus is in control. Jesus is in control. And so who are we going to worship? Who are we going to submit our authority to? Is it our nation? Is it our elected official? Is it our hope in them, in our selection? Or is our hope in Jesus? 
Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is in control. And when we bow down and we worship Jesus, our life becomes different, which ultimately will impact society. It'll impact our families. It'll impact our friends. It'll impact our cities. It'll impact our society. You want to make an impact for God? Then you make Jesus your Lord and Savior. And you bow down to him and you worship him and you become more like Jesus and you will make an impact. Let me pray for you. Father God, we come before you. And Father, with so much political turmoil going on, we can read from Revelation 13 exactly how it fits today. And I'm not trying to manipulate the text by any means. This is relevant. The same way that they had to make a choice back then. Or are they going to worship Rome and Caesar or are they going to stand and worship you? Rome was trying to get them to blaspheme the name of God, to blaspheme against Jesus, to worship Caesar. Father, Satan is still at work today. He's still trying to get us to blaspheme your name, to not accept your ways, to not bow down and worship you, to worship the nation, to worship our lusts, to worship creation, to worship the powers that be. He's still at work trying to influence us and tempt us and discourage us. But Father, pray for anybody who's listening right now who just wants to make the decision that no matter what, I'm going to worship Jesus. I'm going to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I'm going to stop worrying so much about the outcome of this because I know that Jesus is on the throne. I'm going to stop with all the anxiety around here and I'm going to stop trying to attack everyone because I'm fearful of what's going to happen. I am just going to put my trust in Jesus. I'm going to have patience. I'm going to have patient endurance, as this says. I'm going to have faithfulness and put my faith in Jesus. I'm not going to worry so much about the outcome of, of things that are happening right now in this life because ultimately I'm putting my faith in Jesus, that Jesus is on the throne. I'm not going to fear. I'm not going to slander anybody. I'm not going to attack anybody because I'm a person that's going to be loving and kind and merciful and graceful just as my Heavenly Father is. Anybody who wants to make that decision today, Father, I pray for them. I pray that your Holy Spirit is with them. Bind up our tongues when we want to unleash wrath on people. Help us to think through our responses. Help us to be gentle in our responses. Help us to speak truth, but to speak truth in love, as Ephesians 4.16 tells us. Father, we want to be followers of you who speak truth but are passionate about grace and mercy and love. Help us to be loving people today. Help us to have love spill and fill from our hearts to overflow you because we know who you are and we know how much you love us. Help us, Lord, to make an impact in our society when everybody else is fighting, when everybody else is polarized. We are unified, we are harmonized, and we want to bring peace to this earth. Help us to do so. Use us and influence us and work through us. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, amen. Hey, this spoke to you. I hope you share it. You got any prayer requests, drop it in the comment section. Love you guys. Uh, we'll be back on here to finish up Revelation chapter 13 tomorrow uh, before we jump into 14 on Friday. So hope you guys have a wonderful midweek Wednesday afternoon.